Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. It's not uncommon to hear pundits and regular folks making comparisons between the crises we're now facing and other historical moments, such as the 1920s in Germany, or the Spanish influenza, or the global rebellions of the 1960s. But is this an effective approach to gauging the radical potential of now? For the hour, anarchist author and activist Peter Gelderlos shares some of his thoughts on those comparisons, on the revolutionary potential of this moment we're living in, and some lessons from past movements that we might keep in mind now to make the most of these dire times. You can find many of Peter's writings at theanarchistlibrary.org and books available through AK Press and other independent sources and bookstores. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. On the night of August 11th, four people were arrested and charged with rioting in the city of Richmond, Virginia. Media identified them as Julius de la Cruz, Lakshmi Menon, Kira Wynn, and Brian Plotch. I don't know them, and all I know is what I read in the fake news. Given their charges, I hope some folks have set up a support system out there somewhere, and I hope that wherever this audio is located, by the magic of the interweb, those support folks' contact info is posted. That would be cool. The news reported that on the night of August 11th, there was extensive property damage to businesses and windows were smashed out at a Starbucks and the courthouse. Amidst the broken glass and shattered capitalist ambitions was graffiti, spray-painted on the sidewalk. It said, Eat the Rich. Unfortunate as it is, news reports do not indicate that any rich were actually eaten. Now... I'm not speaking for those four people who got arrested. I don't even know them. I'm only speaking for me. When I find that personally, these events are incredibly confusing. What exactly is wrong with smashing windows out of a Starbucks or a courthouse? And if you suspect people of smashing those windows, why subject them to punishments? Courts are part of the pipeline from cops to prisons that plays an integral role in devaluing black and brown lives. I've never seen a courthouse that wouldn't be vastly improved by its windows knocked out. Given the inimical role that courts play in any locale, smashing their windows out isn't rioting, it's community improvement. Anyone suspected of smashing courthouse windows shouldn't get criminal charges. They should get the key to the city and a fucking parade with a marching band, tubas, sorry, I had to add tubas, and likewise, we should consider the role that Starbucks plays in the process of gentrification. Whatever money-grubbing land barons with no regard for black lives wants to whitewash a community and chase out all the non-whites, they use the ruse of community improvement, jacking up rent and luring in young white yuppies. The process is always marked by the introduction of a Starbucks into the neighborhood. Upwardly mobile white people can't get by without their mocha venti cappuccino latte double latte with non-dairy half and half and whipped cream and cinnamon to go along with their raspberry croissants and their oxycotton. So anyone smashing windows out of a Starbucks is, in a very substantial way, confronting a capitalist enterprise that plays a significant role in the devaluation of black lives and black communities. And just to be clear, I'm not saying I support the smashing of windows out of that Starbucks. I'm saying I advocate the smashing of every window out of every Starbucks and the Apple Store and Cracker Barrel. They just sound racist. And again, I can't understand in this new enlightened age why smashing windows out of a Starbucks would be a crime. Isn't the greater crime the displacement of whole communities that Starbucks always facilitates? 
show me a Starbucks that doesn't look better with fresh air flowing in from the outside, and I'll show you a clueless colonizer yuppie who deserves to get punched in the face and have his wallet stolen. Not personal. Think of it as sensitivity training. As for the graffiti, Eat the Rich, I'm again puzzled. It makes no sense to accuse anyone of crimes for advocating an alternative diet. Currently, cows and chickens and pigs are slaughtered by the thousands every day. In the case of cows, they get slammed in the face with a pneumatic hammer and then get hung upside down on meat hooks for some butchers with power tools to disassemble them. It's terrible when you figure those cows never hurt anyone, unlike the rich, who eliminate jobs for profit and leave desperate people sleeping in their cars and exploit the poor and marginalized in sweatshops, manipulating markets, corrupting government officials. All things being equal, if you have a decent recipe for a particular rub that might make them taste a little better, in a world with justice and fairness, those harmless cows would be left to graze, and we'd be slamming rich people in the face with pneumatic hammers, hanging them upside down on meat hooks, and letting butchers with power tools disassemble them. Yes, I'll take the butt cheek of millionaire, medium rare, with onions and mushrooms, please. However you slice it, that means two things. Advocacy for food justice certainly can't constitute crime. So again... I don't know these four people. I don't know what they did or didn't do. But for their own characters and consciences, I can only hope that they smashed windows and sprayed graffiti, and that thousands more did too. And that thousands more will continue to smash windows, so long as courthouses and upscale coffee shops continue to have them. And that sooner or later, we'll all dispose of the wealthy in a practical and sensible way, utilizing our digestive tracts to create social and economic change. We live in a time when four kids accused of trying to change the world for the better, whether they did anything or not, are locked up in jail. In such a world, the question isn't whether... No. In such a world, the question isn't what they're doing in lockup. The question is, what the fuck are you still doing out there? This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain, an exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're smashing windows and eating the rich, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his latest address at Sean Swain number 2015638, Buckingham Correctional, P.O. Box 430, Dillwyn, Virginia 23936. You can find his past writings recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at at Swain Rocks. So I'm speaking with anarchist and author Peter Gelderlos, who's been living in Spain for quite a while. Hi, Peter. We chatted back in, in April of this year about the global pandemic and about where capitalism seemed to be going during it. And now I'm hoping to catch up with you on some of the changes that have developed. Thank you very much for taking the time to chat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to chat again. It's it's always enjoyable. Mutual. Um, the last time that we chatted, Spain was one of the hot spots for COVID nineteen in Europe. Spain was feeling the peak of infections, uh, leading to a lockdown with arrests and fines for those who were caught out on the streets. While the economy still was requiring people to some degree to go to work, there was talk of organizing for rent strikes in the territories controlled by Spain. I was wondering how how has the situation developed since April. Uh, not quite as as rapidly as the U.S., uh, but still here the government jumped on that bandwagon of the economy is more important than human life. And so we need to reopen now. Uh, they reopened in phases, um, starting later than the U.S. and moving a bit more slowly than the U.S. But still, the economy is at this point almost completely opened up. They're trying to encourage tourists to come back to Spain. I think tourism makes up like maybe three times the the proportion of the GDP of the of the Spanish economy as like the US economy for example it's very much dependent on on tourism. That's been complicated by other European Union countries not recommending that their citizens travel to Spain so so tourism has has really not 
taken back off again. Uh, for example, plenty of hotels in Barcelona are at 2% capacity. And nonetheless, most people, people who still have jobs have generally had to go back to work. Public transport is generally full. Uh, they're, and they're even reducing public transport. So it's just, you know, this, this brilliant, you know, brilliant measure to take during a pandemic when you want people to be in fewer crowded spaces to make sure that, you know, public transport is fuller by, uh, by reducing the, uh, the frequency. Obligatory. Uh, and then, you know, you have this, uh, these contradictions of, a you know, consumption based economy where you have to wear a mask on a str- on the street, but then, you know, you're sitting on the terrace of a bar on the street. And of course you don't have to wear a mask. So there have been new outbreaks, and so so Spain remains near the top of the charts for death toll in in the European Union, uh, and they've had to put a number of cities and provinces back under lockdown because of outbreaks. Going by the statistics, Barcelona and, and Madrid and a couple other cities probably should have been put back under lockdown a- according to the government's own criteria, uh, the way they've put some st- smaller cities back under lockdown, but they've, of course, resisted that, again, for the good of the economy. So in terms of social control, things are not quite as as extreme now uh, as during the peak of the lockdown, uh, but they're, you know, they, they are permitting uh, a higher number of, of deaths and infections um, to keep the economy from crashing completely. But again, the economy is, is fairly crashed. And so they're fighting back against that with a huge, huge bailout. They've gotten money from the European Union. Finally, the European Union able to uh, agree on something with, like you know, these more like northern countries, like um, Netherlands and Austria. You know, being very, very reluctant to give these lazy southern countries like Italy and Spain more money. So, so it's it's been you know um, also definitely like. Uh, a situation that's that's sorely tested the the ability of the European Union to be a, a functioning uh, unit. Um, but finally, that money is coming in. A, a huge amount has gone to to the wealthiest. A huge amount has gone to um, business owners getting loans that will probably be completely forgiven to allow them to uh, stay stay running. Um, one of the main things that's trickled down to poorer people is um, companies that have to let workers go because of the pandemic can tap into a fund that basically uh, uses government money to continue paying those workers most of their salary, at least for, for a while. So there is something of a social safety net that at the moment is is preventing absolute rebellion. But yeah, it's not very strong. Uh, people who are already unemployed or didn't have contracts when this thing broke out are, are definitely very vulnerable. And then, like the rental situation is is of course also very uh, very vulnerable with um, uh, evictions starting to to pick up, including you know before they they were legal because of the moratorium. Has there been much of a popular pushback against either the fact that? subsidies or some sort of dole is coming out through the private businesses or against the beginnings of evictions um well i mean as far as for the first part like it is government money so it's it's the government bureaucracy is 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 the one that's like organizing it and and handing it out but I mean, there's different ways to look at it. Like, it favors uh, companies in, in that it ex- excuses them from, from having to foot the bills of um, any obligations for firing workers. So it is definitely very centralized. It is, it is bureaucratically controlled. To get to the heart of the question, it's very clear to people that, you know, hours don't matter as much, that, you know, the, that it's a very classist system, that uh, business owners are the ones who matter. And I think we will see more resistance the more evictions uh, pick up. There, there's also been uh, a huge controversy with like the, the previous king, the father of the current king. It was discovered that he had huge undeclared bank accounts in Switzerland. And so he was uh, potentially going to be put under investigation and he, he just... Um, uh, just he was going to leave the country. And, and you know, just, I mean, like, just the level of... Um, of impunity and corruption and all that. Like people, people get it. People know that it's happening. Uh, though at the moment, things are still, uh, things are still quiet and fairly docile. Um, hopefully that changes, but, but we'll see often, you know, often things kick off in the fall. Yeah. It's interesting that he just off to like Dominican Republic, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
So there have been great memes, but uh, <laughs> you know, so far like, no one is uh, burning his image in the streets. Meanwhile, in the United States, uh, at the beginning of the last call, I described the situation as a show descending into fire, but very slowly. And you've seen months of, to varying degrees, like sustained rebellion since the end of May. I was wondering what conversations have been like with people where you're at about what's been happening in the United States as someone who grew up and was naturalized into the United States and also particularly in the South. Yeah. I mean, first of all, just I'm not sure how much the news spread over there, but that rebellion uh, became at least partially international, and and it got pretty hot for a moment in in the UK and especially France. These are countries in which racialized populations, you know, have a really strong presence, and there, you know, have been historical strong struggles against against colonialism uh, carried out by those by those countries. The Spanish state has been much more effective at. At maintaining this this very uh, delusional, like hyper minority consciousness, if you will, in so far as like white people in Spain tend to um, immediately conflate the categories of racialized person and immigrant, uh, and and imagine them to be like a you know a, a very small, uh, tiny minority, and therefore not very central or important or relevant to the, the Spanish experience, whatever that is. And, you know, you can imagine in contrast, like in the U.S., someone, you know, it's, it's impossible to make any analysis of the, of the U.S. that's even remotely coherent without, without play, placing questions of, of race and colonialism and, and white supremacy front and center. Um, but a lot of people still, a lot of white people in Spain, uh, most of them, I would say, still try to do that. And, and so then that also means that, that, you know, racialized people who are fighting back against racism are, are much more uh, marginalized and often have to do it more from this, you know, minority status that's, that, that gives them less legitimacy to, to raise a ruckus. Speaking with, I mean, speaking with racialized uh, comrades, there was ob- a very obvious connection. Um, and there wasn't, I mean, you know, the U.S. is treated as like this sort of spectacular country because of Hollywood, because of cultural imperialism. And it's also very strange, a very strange country. Uh, I mean, it's hell. It's a strange country to me, but it's it's an yeah, especially right. strange country to people who didn't uh, grow up there. But and and so that's that's one of the things that white people, white Europeans, do all the time is like you're uh, um, they treat racism as like a um, an American problem and a spectacle to be consumed rather than recognizing the way European power structures created race uh, throughout the process of colonialism. And in, in contrast to that, racialized comrades uh, you know, immediately saw the connection and, and saw it as, as a global issue, one that is every bit as relevant here as it is in the U.S. and immediately started talking about all the people who, all the racialized people who have been killed by police in the Spanish state. Uh, and of course, the numbers are not as high because because it's not a settler state. You know, there's a social welfare safety net that you know that's used to control people more frequently and more as a first resort than just shooting them, like in in the U.S. But the, actually, the proportion of of racialized people killed by police uh, is is even higher, is even more racist in the Spanish state. So that connection was was made immediately. But because of the way the issue was marginalized, uh, it was really um, maintained in the space of like more like pacifist vigils trying to take these first baby steps of raising awareness but i you know i really hope that it's uh you know a faster process here and and you know that it is given more importance and more more support this is the final straw radio and i'm talking to anarchist and author peter gelderlos about revolution reaction and historical analogs of today so similar to the experience that you're expressing in in spain and like alongside of this uprising that's been happening in in the u.s the american population has been feeling more and more the pinch of the pandemic and the economic slowdown with the same expectations coming from the capitalists and and from the government to operate as usual i'm wondering like what what your observations have been in terms of this contradiction uh and any sort of like social contract to protect the populace from from danger I actually don't find all of the the horrible missteps and the incompetence and, and above all just the sheer apathy that surprising in the US. Back in April, I'm pretty sure we, we talked about the centrality of necropolitics in, in a settler state in the US in particular. So uh, so I, I think it's it's fairly par for the course. I mean, of course the, the Trump administration just due to 
sheer stupidity and their tendency towards conspiracy theories and, and stuff like that adds adds another grotesque element to it. But the basic reality of just letting so many people die, uh, I think, is is very um, uh, very typical uh, within U.S. history. And taking it to the global dimension, one thing that's interesting uh, gets to what surprised me more is that many uh, many states that have been historically uh, welfare states have been tending more towards uh, allowing higher death tolls. Uh, but I think largely they did that after the U.S. The US and, and Brazil really took center stage, just really um, lowered the bar so much. And that took a lot of pressure off uh, other states that are historically welfare states to, to do everything possible to keep the death toll down. I think that gave them more, more leverage to... Um, more openly prioritize the economy, let the death toll get a little bit higher uh, because there was no chance that they were going to do it as poorly as, as the US or Brazil and, and get death tolls that high. Is that like the UK like arguing that it's pushing towards a herd immunity idea at one point? Like, could that fall into what descript- what you're describing? A, a little bit, but I mean, well, so the, the UK is, is definitely uh, under the, the Johnson administration is very much more in line with with the U.S. I mean, the NHS over there, which had been quite good, had been largely dismantled. So I was thinking more along the lines of um, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, uh, and and especially because of how how these were countries that had very strict response early on, and the way they started reopening after the U.S. Uh, reopened. I, th- I think that was the moment when they when they started taking these cues of realizing that actually they wouldn't have such great political consequences for reopening a bit faster uh, and being a little bit more um, fast and loose with the death toll. Just because I-, I think even though it wasn't surprising, I think no one no one imagined you know earlier on like in April that like the U.S. would just would basically just let its death toll you know pop above one hundred and fifty thousand so quickly. And so that it just the horror gets relativized. And so something that might be interesting to talk about is is how uh, at this moment of of all of these interlocking crises, this these strategies of neoliberal austerity have 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 stayed so strong uh, despite being discredited on so many fronts. Just beyond being discredited, just uh, being the causes of a lot of these crises. And so a lot of states have really stuck by their guns, and they've and they've stuck by. You know this this strategy that they had through the '80s and '90s and the zeros of um, of, of neoliberal austerity. So that's that's been interesting, and and I think at least in part, uh, just the U.S. doing its thing of you know letting its underclasses die in mass or or forcing them to die has um, has made it easier for other countries to do the same on a smaller scale. So by the austerity measures, you mean things like limiting so, quote unquote like entitlements during this period of time not providing public testing or uh, withholding spending on providing PPE for frontline workers or for parts of the population, like this sort of thing? All all of those things and also preserving the the undermining and the defunding of healthcare that had been going on for the decade or the decades previous to this crisis. So, I mean, you know, you'll have a few, I mean, if people on the on the, you know on the, the bottom of society are aware of that and they're aware that that's why the death tolls are, are so high in large part, but um, within official discourse within the medium, you're not seeing a lot of proposals for reversing those measures for breaking with this uh, hegemonic ideology of the last few decades. So even though and, and this this links into all the other crises, this links into the crisis of accumulation that capitalism exp- is experiencing. The, the, the huge recession going on, which which was going to happen either way, regardless of the pandemic. But of course, it's much stronger thanks to the pandemic. Uh, this re- links into the, eco- um, the ecological crisis. Uh, it links in also to to questions of um, of white supremacy and colonialism and and the crisis of democracy. They're aware of this. They're aware that their entire game is at risk of just collapsing, and they're still not shifting into. Uh, uh, breaking with that hegemonic ideology, shifting into some kind of reform ideology, and then I guess you know that's just being realistic. That's the you know the the lag between being aware of a problem and and changing your entire belief system. So I think eventually it will have to happen. It's just curious seeing it in real time. How long it takes them to to you know just um, 
wake up and smell the coffee. But I guess, you know, it was similar. I mean, you know, the, the huge stock market crash and global recession in 1929. I mean, in the U.S., it took them several years of just, uh, uh, I guess, what was it? Yeah, Hoover uh, still being president. You know, like they never they never backed down. They never ate humble pie. They never really changed their um, their strategy. And it wasn't until FDR came in that you saw like a huge change in economic strategies uh, from from the government. So, you know, you read it in a history book and, you know, you can jump from uh, 1929 to what would have been 19, 1933, I guess. But, you know, when you're actually living it now, it's just uh, kind of insane how, how much they and how pathetically they try to stick to their guns. But, you know, again, it shouldn't be a surprise because they're not the ones dying. Yeah. And it seemed like it, I mean, in that instance, it's pointed to generally that like the U.S. government probably changed policy in a lot of ways, where the ruling class like made the decision towards the creation of some sort of safety net uh, measures, you know, of the, um, yeah, of the, of FDR's administration because of the rising threat of, of anti-capitalist organizing. Yeah. Yeah. While this has been going on, there's also been these, these ongoing protests around the country, um, that have resulted in a pretty amazing in some ways, like shift in popular dialogue around expectations of the existence of police. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, through the, the, like the, definitely the, uh, like the showing of the killing of, of George Floyd, the video that was recorded, the subsequent like leaks of more of the video that just showed just how f-ing despicable the police acted in that instance and how it wasn't just some sort of sense. Of, it couldn't even be argued that it was like a, a sense of personal feeling of threat, but uh, that piled up with all of these other names of individuals who were killed because of anti-black racism, um, because of police impunity, uh, and I think probably the stresses of the pandemic all sort of seem to coincide in this boiling over of of rage in a lot of ways, in a way that I like experienced to be very controlled. Like there wasn't a bunch of cops getting assassinated around the country, but thousands of individuals around the country just sort of rising up in their different areas to challenge symbols of white supremacy, to challenge police departments, to hold space to hold memorial for the people that have been killed like recently or, or long gone. What does that look like from where you're at? Or sort of what does that say? What does that shift in dialogue around like the expectations of, of the legitimacy of policing existing? Like, do you think that that's like a, something that'll last or um, does it represent the, the police being called into existence represent like a major shift in, in the radical possibilities of the moment? I, I think it's amazing. I think it's inspiring. I think it definitely changes the radical possibilities of, of the moment. Uh, seeing it, such a popular movement uh, communicate very powerful and radical ideas very quickly. It will last if we make it last. I mean, memory is a living thing. It's a thing that we, that we nurture and that we keep alive or that we let die. Uh, the institutional left, the centrists, the media, the Democrats, they definitely want to kill that memory and they're working overtime. Uh, just how quickly, you know, they were able to change, uh, abolish the police, to defund the police, to make small changes in the way the police are funded. I, you know, the impression I get from a distance is, you know, people people still remember that, but it's, um, you know, some sometimes that stuff can, can disappear in a year if, uh, you know, if we don't keep this other vision alive and, and help people remember both the anger and the hope that, that they were feeling. Uh, so yeah, it's, you know, it's a moment still of a lot of possibility, but it's also, I think definitely very useful to look at who was most effective in bringing an end to that rebellion. If, if it has ended, of course, you know, that, you know, they also continue in spontaneous in, in, in subterranean ways, but who who has been most effective in decreasing the force of that rebellion? Who has been most effective in corrupting uh, the meaning of that rebellion? And you know, of course, there's a lot of a lot of great analysis out there, and you know, a lot of people are are still putting up a great fight about the the meaning of the rebellion, the meaning of of, of the idea that Black Lives Matter, uh, the meaning of the criticism of police, and of course, those who are trying to you know to corrupt it or to turn it into a, a very tame thing have a lot more funding they have a lot more resources they have access to the media but you know like like you pointed out the 
a rebellion, you know, spreading across the country like that and spreading this idea of, of abolishing the police shows that, that we also have, uh, have the power to, to take over a social conversation and, and to create a social conversation. We just need to figure out how to do it more consistently. This is the final straw radio and I'm talking to anarchist and author Peter Gelderlos about revolution, reaction, and historical analogs of today. So during the uprising, it was pretty notable, I think, that the federal administration, working with a lot of a lot of city and state governments, started deploying more use of federal policing and military technologies run by military agencies, such as like drones, for instance, being operated by DHS agencies using military technologies and and software to be able to track in real time the movements of uprisings most notably in 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 Minneapolis and the de- deployment of federal police to cities like Portland and now supposedly to Seattle, Detroit, Chicago and other like democrat quote unquote democrat run cities does this in your view represent a shift in in policy or an escalation of like pre-existing policies and relationships between local policing agencies and state governments and the federal government? Is it is there something significantly different to this, or is it just a bunch of bluster and it's more of the same? Um, I don't think it's just a bunch of bluster. I don't think it's any. I also don't think it's anything terribly new. I mean, for one thing, uh, NATO countries going back, I think at least ten years. I can't remember when they made this decision, but they had like a decision for. Uh, uh, urban operations 2020 uh, NATO countries had already made a joint commitment to increase the domestic use of of the military which is you know technically not supposed to be constitutional in in the US but of course always also from the very beginning it's always been uh, standard just with you know a, a couple pro forma uh, limitations and then that's something that we can we can also see you know going back to um, to, you know, different hurricane responses uh, going back to Katrina and before. So that's that's something that they've they've already been increasing uh, the use of, uh, of of domestic military deployments every time they get an opportunity. Previously, it's been mostly so-called natural disasters. There are examples like Standing Rock. But then if you look at the history of, of anti-racist, anti-police rebellions in the U.S., uh, those are typically the moments when the state makes these organizational advance uh, in policing, in militarized policing. After 68, there were changes to law. There was increased cooperation uh, between FBI and local police, getting getting military equipment to the police, creation of SWAT forces, retrofitting uh, the architecture of cities to allow for uh, easier military deployment with like, for example, um, highway on ramps and off ramps in, in Los Angeles being, um, and stuff like that. So, so already, uh, you know, also after, after, uh, 92 in Los Angeles, uh, already the big moments of advance or progress, if you will, uh, with, with more militarization of the police with black rebellions in the United States. And that of course makes perfect sense with, with the history of this country, what this country, uh, what the United States has, um, has always been about. So that's, that's not new, uh, but it's also not bluster. It's definitely uh, a step forward from the perspective of, of the state, uh, this white supremacist settler state uh, and, and a step forward for social control against human freedom, against anti-racism, against black rebellions. Um, so that's that's real um and you know like the especially like the use of drone technology uh also logical that you know that would be the next menu but you know that was uh, definitely um a qualitative step um it's it's real but it it's it's also i think uh important to be careful how uh how we talk about it to make sure that we understand how that's completely consistent with with the history of the US as as a settler state and that we don't jump to, to simplifications for example the the degree of centralization there so i, th- I think we need to understand the way that the federal government completely stepped back from the pandemic and just let people die i mean a pandemic is a great opportunity 
for a state to deploy more, more centralized power. So if, if the goal was, you know, this like, you know, centralization towards totalitarianism understood in this obsolete 20th century sense of like, you know, 1984 or whatever, or Nazi Germany, then you can't really explain why the federal government did what it did or rather did what it didn't do uh, during the pandemic by not taking advantage whatsoever of the opportunity to justify more centralized power. And what they did, in fact, was they justified uh, this apathetic laissez approach that that caused you know a huge number of deaths that makes so we need to understand that uh hand in hand with the federal government stepping in to to help states and to help cities uh even if you know they supposedly didn't want it uh to to, to just try to physically crush this uh predominantly black rebellion of course portland you know didn't want it because they had a more intelligent social control strategy and they realized that sending those federal uh, police in there was was actually extending extending the rebellion. Uh, but in any case, you know the you know on, in the, on the one hand it's a more centralized, a more authoritarian strategy. On the other hand, it's a more decentralized strategy. We need to understand those hand in hand, and they make perfect sense with you know with under the lens of the U.S. as as a settler state. This is the final straw radio, and I'm talking to anarchist and author Peter Gelderlos about revolution, reaction, and historical analogs of today. So on the note of comparing historical moments, it, like, it, it seems pretty natural that we tend to want to say that, oh, this is just like, you know, the end of the Weimar Republic, or, or this, like, these moves that the administration are making are, you know, by consolidating power in this way, um, not in the, in the social contract manner of, of, taking care of portions of the population, but in terms of applying its force across longer, larger and larger swaths with less, with more impunity. Um, like a lot of people have, have made the comparison actually throughout Trump's administration, I guess, like going into it because of the way that he talks and the kind of people that he keeps around him of the uh, historical rise of fascism in the 1920s and thirties in Europe. Can you talk a little bit about some of the strengths or some of the weaknesses of, of that approach of kind of historicizing the moment and trying to look for analogs in history? I think uh, making complex comparisons with other historical moments, I think, is important. Uh, but that means looking for similarities as much as looking for differences. And right now, there's a lot more differences between our situation and the situation in the, in the Weimar Republic. There, there are very few similarities there, actually. I think that method of, of nuanced comparison is much better than the analog method um, because when you're, I mean, when you're just making an analogy, a historical analogy, you're you're kind of hammering things in in place to fit, and you're you're ignoring all these differences. And it's especially problematic when people have this sort of Hollywood esque vision of history in which practically the only thing that happened in the 20th century is is the Nazis. You know, they're the big the big boogeyman. Um, uh, I, and and there's there have been many different revolutionary moments and many different moments of reaction. I think it's really important to look at those, not to find okay, you know what, you know this, you know right now we're dealing with the sequel of which reactionary movement, but to understand why things happen the way they did, so we can understand why they'll happen uh, the way they'll happen now, and they're not going to happen the same way as they happened in the past. The you know there's like the you know that that phrase that. That history repeats itself, but it's it doesn't repeat itself like a bad J.J. Abrams movie, which is just you know uncreative writing and just you know rehashing some old plot that's already been put out there. They're they're going to happen again, but in a completely different way. In fact, I like to some some friends of mine were uh, talking about reaction from uh, a queer perspective, disputing the idea of progress, disputing the idea of things always getting better. And, and I, I hope I can do it justice, but basically what they were saying is that there's a very widespread idea in, in queer and trans communities today that, that they've never had it better, that, that they're you know, in a moment of the most, most freedom and, and safety uh, possible you know, compared with, with past moments. And, and these friends were saying that, you know, well, that's actually happened at least two times before, just, um, just in the 20th century. One was in, uh, in Berlin during the Weimar Republic, and the other was in certain neighborhoods of New York and San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. The first time that that degree of relative freedom and safety was lost was, of course, because of the Nazis. 
the second time was because of of the AIDS pandemic, another uh, epidemic, another great example of of necropolitics in action, just creating the conditions for people to die. Uh, and those two examples illustrates how extremely broad the options are for reaction, that the state has really a, a huge toolbox to use for killing off our movements, for killing off our spaces. Uh, I mean, what, like, are we going to say if we're just going to reduce everything to this, this, this constant, urgent, uh, cliche danger of fascism that what AIDS was fascism? Uh, um, that obviously, you know, is just... Uh, drifting off into meaninglessness. So reaction is is very obviously a danger. You know, our, our movements are getting stronger. We're, we're um, making big advances. So we should expect to, to see reaction, but we shouldn't expect to see, uh, you know, some trite rerun of, uh, of a 1933 film. So using that metric to s- sort of say that things like, things maybe echo more than they do repeat. Are any, yeah. Are there any moments that, I mean, I like the, I prefer the J.J. Abrams, uh, you know, reference, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to be biting your style. I do hate me some J.J. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> are there historical, like, echoes that you can see in, or maybe like time periods that we could be looking to right now for inspiration or... Um, or, or challenge in terms of this moment when disaster capitalism, pandemic capitalism is, is really like pushing down on us. Like the last chat that we had parts of the conversation in terms of like, what was inspiring, what were some areas to, to put in energy that might have some possible like positive outcomes were like, for me, they reminded me of hearing about the, or thinking about the autonomous movements in the 1970s and late Mm -hmm. 60s. Um, and early 80s. So like coordinating resistance to evictions, opening up squats, neighborhood councils. I mean, these are not things that are like limited to that specific historical period because they've been reflected in how popular, how communities organize themselves both for resistance and for sustenance. Like for me, this feels like a potential, like a very potentially revolutionary moment in a way that I have not experienced in my lifetime. And I've heard a lot of other people express things similar to that. It seems like, although to to keep in mind, there are a lot of people who are being put in more and more dire situations and that and being oppressed is not a recipe for somebody rising up in a liberatory manner. But similarly, these last couple of months of seeing people struggle not only in the streets against police repression and in a lot of cases, stand up alongside of people that don't look like them to say this system that is, there's a discrepancy between how it impacts me in terms of racist policing and how it impacts you. But I, this is important enough for me to stand out here and, and continue being with you in a way that puts myself in very physical danger. It feels like there is a moment happening and it feels like also using a historical comparisons can be helpful in maybe looking to not, not to limit the scope of where we might go from here, what we might think to deploy, but, but to sort of inspire, are there any like inspirational historical moments that you think are interesting to look to and how they relate to, to what we're seeing right now? To be honest, I'm feeling a bit more, pessimistic even though i would say that without a doubt uh we are in the um the most revolutionary moment globally since like the long 60s 1968 and and maybe even on some levels since um since like 1917 1919 uh although i would say our movements are in a lot of ways weaker when you indicated before via email that you were going to ask a question like this about opportunities, I've I, the the reading I started doing, things I was looking into, I found more of, uh, ways that we fudged uh, revolutionary opportunities. I also have a question of how much time we have because uh, there's uh, I'd kind of like to maybe do like a a brief review of different revolutionary moments and how the state reacted, and I think maybe in that context it might be easier to make sense of the the present moment. We have as much time as you need. TFSR is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Ransom notes. It is a, a revolutionary. Anarchist and anti-authoritarian music podcast. That's going to come out every month. 
Ransom what? So what's like, I mean, what's your like ultimate goal, I guess, in, in this yeah. game? We out for the Rising up against the oppressor. The attitude that you see in hip-hop. Let me uh, give you a sample of some of the uh, lyrics that had some of the older ladies among the stockholders quite with dismay. Go to ransomnotes.com Or get them from the Channel Zero Network. So I, I very much appreciate the, the optimistic phrasing of the question, um, even if, if I, I find myself inadequate to, to answer on that level. But I think we can get there if we run through some of the main moments of, of revolutionary openings and reaction uh, over the last century. But first, to kind of talk about the archetypal moment, be um, the French Revolution, and and that's also the response to the French Revolution, particularly from Edmund Burke, was was really the birth of modern conservatism. Uh, we go from you know your more run of the mill varieties, even the fascist varieties, they have uh, some things in common. So so to to look at that, what you know what you had, you had the French monarchy and aristocracy squeezing the peasantry more and more. There wasn't really any out. There wasn't much chance for development uh, for the commoners, even the the, the fledgling bourgeoisie. Um, they made their revolution, they killed the king, they started killing one another, obviously a very simplified version. And, you know, eventually you had uh, the, the counter-revolution take over, eventually you had Napoleon create, a, create a, an empire. So what is conservatism in all this? It's not the way things were before, it's not the aristocracy per se before the revolution, rather it's the part of society that sees these revolutionary changes and becomes afraid for the possible loss of their privileges or the threat to their privileges and their status. So what they're reacting to is change, even as though um, Edmund Burke, for example, took a lot of the aspects of, of modernization from the French Revolution and, and centralism, a lot of the, the, the ways, in fact, certain aspects of their totalitarianism, of their organizational efficiency, and proposed defending these aristocratic privileges or this this orderly Christian world with some of these um, forms of revolutionary organization or revolutionary terror even. It's not just the thing that was before, but it's, it's an attempt to defend a very idealized version of those privileges in a new and, and changed world. Because obviously, if you look at it, the French state under Napoleon was much stronger than than the French state under under the monarchy of of, of Louis the Fourteenth. So what that says is that there's there's an element of progress there, state advancing, getting stronger. But there's also an element there of of kind of mindless reaction, and this this illustrates one important point: the future almost never belongs to the right. Uh, the future almost never belongs to these concerns. They shape what happens, uh, but they almost always give way. So Edmund Burke, of course, his greatest influence was, was in the UK. And at the time that he was um, elaborating these ideas, and at the time that, that obviously the majority of the aristocracy in the UK was very afraid of what was happening in France, they were also surrendering to a modernization that, uh, in, for example, you know, decreased the power of the House of Lords, it decreased the power of the nobility, and it, uh, it gave the bourgeoisie a clear path to develop, to take over society, to increase in their power, but in a way that would increase the power of all of the ruling classes and the British state overall. Also, of course, with, um, with colonialism being you know, a huge path for development to, for them to mutually increase their power. So this conservative view of society actually didn't triumph, even as it motivated the ruling classes to, to mobilize themselves against the revolutionary danger. So that's kind of the archetype, and that, that really holds true a lot. 1917, revolutionary moment. It seems to really to have taken states by surprise surprise, uh, perhaps the furor of, of their, their reaction against revolutionary mo movements of the 18th, of the 19th century, sorry, particularly the, the Paris Commune, which they just massacred completely. So they really didn't seem to be so prepared for these revolutionary movements that, uh, that sprung up in, uh, in Russia, in Germany, in Italy especially. So in Italy and in Germany, 
they they kind of went into emergency and they crushed these uh, movements with military means using whatever they had on hand, which meant empowering, which meant the the traditional ruling classes empowering uh, militarized elements that they might not otherwise have wanted to empower so much. So even though that that, that meant having to give in to a, a huge social transformation that they otherwise might not have favored, doing so because of the urgency of the moment, because you know they hadn't reacted uh, quickly enough in, in Russia and they knew that they needed to prevent a, a, prevent a revolution. Uh, incidentally, of course, the fascist governments that arose, they didn't, they didn't last a long time. Also, this is very important. They arose in countries that did not have the colonial expansion because they had been knocked off from that uh, in losses in previous conflicts with, uh, with European powers uh, in earlier decades. So basically, Britain and France were, were practically monopolizing the colonial question. And the countries that turned towards fascism were the ones whose, whose bourgeoisie did not have this huge access to colonial markets in order to grow. So a large part of, of fascism was to upset the European order so that these, these countries could restart their, their colonial empires. And that's something that's completely dissimilar right now with, with the U.S. This is The Final Straw Radio, and I'm talking to anarchist and author Peter Gelderlos about revolution, reaction, and historical analogs of today. The U.S. has had access to, um, to a sort of you know, neo-imperial system. Uh, no one is blocking off access to that. It's, it's just pissing it away due to its own, due to its own stupidity. So that's you know, one, one major structural and economic dissimilarity. Let's jump ahead to 1944, 1945. This time states were prepared. They realized that after you have a huge world war, after you demand these huge sacrifices from the populations and all of the, the hardship that comes war, and also being aware that when a war ends, you tend to get an economic recession. And, and I mean, in, in Europe, you had very like armed, well-organized partisan movements uh, in a lot of places is mostly communist, but also in, in other places, mostly uh, anarchist, uh, because largely because of the experience of the Spanish Civil War. So the ruling states, the dominant states, they didn't wait to see what would happen. They took the initiative already in, in the UK, I think it was already in 1944, but in, in any case, before the war ended, uh, socialists took power, Clement Attlee, uh, and they, they made all these major reforms. They brought about the welfare state. In France, you had a power-sharing government with de Gaulle, you know, keeping it in a more centrist direction. But the Communist Party had, you know, and the Socialist Party also, they had, they played a, a huge role there. They started a welfare state. Italy, uh, you know, they they had some socialist policies that they that they enacted. And then you got the Marshall Plan from the U.S., which was, you know, the the one major country that wasn't completely destroyed by World War II preempting a recession by creating a huge avenue for capitalist growth with all of this investment in Europe, rebuilding European economies. And then you had the Communist Party uh, on action of the USSR preventing revolutions in Europe to preserve, preserve their new geopolitical order, their stability that Stalin had won. So they completely betrayed the, the, the communist movement in, in Greece, for example, got them all disarmed. And, and so we had this, this you know, complicity between Western capitalists and the Communist Party to prevent revolution all throughout Europe in, in this moment that would have been perfect for it. So that was them learning their lessons after 1917. 1968, another, another big moment that, uh, you know, that came out largely out of, out of these, um, you know, out of popular movements more than, you know, questions of war or, or recession. What happened there? Uh, so, you know, we look at Germany, the U.S. and France and Italy, some countries where, where the revolutionary movement was really big, public and thorough and spew. These movements mobilized a huge portion of the, of the population, were really radical. They were prevented from getting to a full-out revolution in, in France uh, and in Italy, largely because they were sabotaged by the Communist Party, still playing this role, this more um, conservative role of trying to dominate movements and trying to have this very gradual approach to change. And then in France, what happened after 68 is um, uh, the, the part of the population that, that felt threatened or that didn't identify with this movement uh, or that felt betrayed by you know, this, this internal fighting uh, basically allowed the right to, to get an electoral victory. So in both France and the U.S., you had a huge shift to the right uh, that allowed for right-wing governments that first um, instituted strong new police measures 
and strong repression against these social movements. And then started, uh, you know, in the US, you know, you got this, the beginning of the war on crime uh, with, with Nixon. And then uh, you got the beginning of neoliberalism and, and austerity, first with Thatcher in the UK, then with Reagan in the US. In Germany, uh, you also had a really strong movement there, and it was actually quite different because the left, uh, the, the right wing was already in power there. So they didn't have the same option, but it's curious that they could just do the opposite thing and it worked just as well for them. Uh, the right wing grip on power was broken and the Socialist Party came into power for the first time. And of course, institutionalized any of these revolutionary feelings and prevented things from getting out of control. In Italy, it was difficult because they had a, centri a centrist party that, that kept things under control. So you really had like a bloody counterinsurgency uh, organized in large part by the um, the CIA and there all throughout the 70s preventing a revolutionary movement uh, and then in Spain uh, you know the, the fascists themselves were convinced that they, their interests would actually be better served under a democracy so in the next decade you had a transition to democracy so you have different you know the same geopolitical situation the same rough economic situation in all these different countries and different strategies in every country according to the circumstances that they're in but usually generally just you know a shift from one you know, one part of the political arena to, to the other. What is, so hopefully that wasn't too winded, but just to the present moment. What is different about the present moment? There hasn't been a world war. There is a recession. It's not being caused only by this tendency of capitalism to, to generate bubbles. What we have now is a situation in which there are all of these different crises that are intersecting. Uh, democracy is, is not working on a global level. The, the institutions that the, that the U.S. created to, to allow for global capitalism and for participation between you know, all of these different uh, nation states around the world is no longer believes in it, uh, least of all the U.S. The U.S., in fact, has been the most active one to sabotage it. Uh, and then there's also this, you know, this recurring question of, of colonialism, of white supremacy, all these internal rebellions, which are really um, you know, belying the pretensions of democracy. You have a huge recession. You also have the ecological crisis. That's that's not going away. Capitalists are aware that that climate change and other forms of ecological disaster are actually a huge existential threat. So this is actually a problem for states because they won a lot of these these previous revolutionary moments. They won the reaction in large part through police measures. Police measures actually played a part, but now this is one intersection of crises that simply can't be beaten down it can't be just jailed it's 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 a lot of crises that are threatening capitalism that police measures have absolutely no chance of solving and so not only are we dealing with states that have a recent history of of solving their problems through police measures we also have ruling classes who have not personally lived through any revolutionary moment. I mean, there are very, very few people in the ruling class today who, who were conscious and playing an active role during the revolutionary movement of the long 60s. So these are people who have grown up believing that nothing wrong could ever, uh, no, no, nothing harmful could ever happen to them. And so that's, that's scary because of the, you know, the sense of entitlement and the links that they'll go to preserve a world that's already ending. But it, you can also understand it as, as, as an opportunity. Right now, the ruling classes are aware that their machine is not working. They are aware that some kind of reform will be necessary. Uh, you can take uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, who's the president of the European Central Bank. She was the, um, the, the director of the IMF. So she's you know, one of the most influential, important capitalist technical. Democrats on a world stage. She said at, at a, you know, a private conference of investors and capitalists and, and uh, politicians that capitalism then within 20, 25 years because of, um, because of climate change. And, and, you know, that's just one example of, of a crisis that they've been absolutely incapable of responding to with any semblance of realism. Just like, you know, they, they have not been very realistic in their, in their responses to climate change or their responses to anti-racist, anti-police movements. I mean, is, is anyone really going to be fooled by like what more body cameras or like, uh, if, you know, if it's the federal government funding the police a little bit more instead of state governments, like clearly no one, you know, they're, they're not putting any reforms on the table that are going to be satisfying to anyone. The fact that in a pandemic, the Democratic Party can't even find a way to, to support universal health care. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it demonstrates that even though they're conscious of a problem, they 
have not found a way at all to organize themselves to make realistic proposals uh, and and to even conceive of reform. They they just can't conceive of breaking with this neoliberal mode in which they're they're just in this total parasitical parasitical capitalism. I mean, right now, capitalists, they're, you know, equity funds are just gutting the economy, uh, destroying productive enterprises to make a huge amount of profit for, you know, the very richest of capitalists. So we're in this moment of just, you know, total piratical, parasitical uh, capitalism where, you know, the ship's burning and, and they're stealing the silverware, which, you know, if, you know, we were living, you know, watching this from some other vantage point would be, would be hilarious. Um, so basically, we're we're in what world systems theorists uh, refer to as a period of systemic chaos, in which we have a global system, you know, capitalism and the nation state. It does constitute this global system, but no one is at the steering wheel. The thing is on a collision course with with an iceberg, and they're you know, they're fi- they're not even fighting over what direction to go, and they're fighting over uh, I don't know, uh, you know, who who won the badminton tournament or some other you know completely paltry or irre- irrelevant. So that's scary because, you know, there's more likely to be major wars in periods of systemic uh, chaos. It's scary because, like you mentioned, you know, people are dying and, you know, they're, you know, they're, you know, Nero's fiddling while Rome burns that kind of situation. But yeah, it's, you could, um, you could also look at it as an opportunity because they have very little credibility right now. They have less capacity for intelligent strategies that will, that will rescue their system. And I've, you know, I've said at, at examples that, you know, could be inspiring or that could give us hope. I, I haven't really found any. What I've found instead are classic ways that we have wasted similar opportunities. Um, if, if you like, and if I haven't been speaking too long, I could, I could name two or three of those and uh, try to be brief. Please do. This is The Final Straw Radio, and I'm talking to anarchist and author Peter Gelderlos about revolution, reaction, and historical analogs of today. Okay, so... One thing that I've seen a lot in our generation that I think has also happened before, but it's you know uh, it's definitely present in our generation. And I also want to I want to underline this because the the revolutionary movements and the combative movements that are happening now are definitely related to economic crisis and these other crises, but they were not produced by those. I really want to underline that um, the first big rebellions uh, happened at a moment when capitalism seemed to be on top of the world with no problems whatsoever in a moment of growth, completely trapped. You know, you have the Zapatista rebellion in 94, you have the gas war and the water war in, in Bolivia in the early 2000s, uh, you have the French banlieue uprising in 2007, um, and then the, the Greek and in the insurrection in Greece was technically after you had the subprime mortgage crisis, but the economic crisis hadn't gotten to Greece yet. So it was not arguably produced by economic conditions related to a recession in Greece. The Gezi Park uprising in Istanbul happened at a moment when the Turkish economy was in full growth. So our movements, our rebellions are not simple material products of recession and crisis. And I would argue, in fact, that we play a hand in creating crisis or at least hastening crisis. The fact that things were supposedly going so well and you have these rebellions popping off, that makes investors more prone to panic. It makes investors realize that, you know, things are not as as safe for them as as they'd like to think and that maybe they can't keep passing these austerity measures uh, without without some consequences. Uh, Also, let's look at the anti-police rebellions. Um, back in 2004, 2005, 2006, and seven, so obviously, you know, anarchists are not responsible for the, the anti-police rebellions, even though, you know, there have, there's been a lot of anarchist participation in anti-police rebellions, and, and black anarchism is, is, is something that's, that's increasingly, uh, you know, growing and becoming influential, and, and has a very good take on these rebellions. Uh, so if I'm going to talk about anarchists now, it's just because that's, that's my personal subjective um, perspective in those years that i mentioned you know 2004 to 2007 anarchists in the u.s were talking a lot about responding to police murders and taking part in rebellions against police violence being present breaking with this ridiculous pacifist um tendency that had taken root in which anarchists you know might put a lot of effort into into diy projects but we're just not going to be on on the streets and fighting back against police murders. So that was that was a re-conversation that was happening uh, in those years. And, and anarchists in some different places, I remember particularly in, in the Midwest, 
found ways to be present uh, in the streets with others who were, who were fighting back against police violence. In the first instances, it was really small, but those are the things that need to happen before it can get big. Uh, and that happened, you know, way, way before the, the, the economic crisis and, and these other crises. So, uh, you know, there's, there's an element of spontaneity without a doubt. You know, you can't just decide when these things pop off. But this was something that, you know, people took these risks and they decided to, to very, very uh, strategically and um, intentionally make a practice out of always fighting back against police violence and police murders. And then when, when the insurrection popped off in Greece, that was also for some people anyways, that was a, um, uh, an inspiration and, and certainly, you know, made that practice more common. Then you had the Oscar Grant rebellion, uh, Ferguson. So, you know, this has a long history, of course, and, and part of the history is people making the decision to draw a line, to not accept certain levels of, of violence, certain levels of oppression. What does it take for someone to be in a society that tells you that there's no problem here, that everything is peaceful, that everything is hunky-dory? What does it take to decide in that context to, to f*** shit up, to fight back, to, to say, actually, we live in a war? I mean, right now, in the U.S., in Spain, in a lot of places, it's easy to say, we live in a war zone. People aren't going to look at you crazy if you say, we live in a war zone. In the U.S., in 2005, in the majority of neighborhoods, I mean, even other poor people would, would look at you funny, like you were a little bit crazy if you if you talked about the social war, if you said, you know, actually, this is a war that the state and capitalists have been waging against all of us in differentiated ways, without a doubt, for a very long time. Nowadays, that's a common sense position, but it, it took a while to get there. It takes a certain antisocial panache, if you will, to... Um, to be able to make that break in a moment of social peace. So these mom- these movements got stronger thanks to that, that anti-social, insurrectional uh, uh, combatant that, that broke the social peace. And the ironic thing, oh crap, I haven't been brief at all, have I? Shoot, I've been uh, going on half an hour again. So, okay, so, we, so we've, okay, we've, we've, we've set the groundwork of the, 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 this anti-social element. What happens when this grows, when this blows up? All of a sudden, you know, you're, you know, you're fighting as a revolutionary in a, in a society that believes revolution doesn't even exist. And all of a sudden, you have the possibility to talk with your neighbors. You have the possibility to talk with strangers and to share these ideas. And they're right there with you. That feels fucking great. That's like a huge difference because psychologically, it, it wears down on you to be in that antisocial mode. A lot of people don't do it well, and they do it by becoming really arrogant and um, dismissive of other people. Because that's the psychological armor that they've needed to roll in that in that antisocial mode for so long. Other people, they go in the opposite direction, to the opposite extreme. And the moment they um, can communicate with most of the rest of society, I think what happens is they hold on to some of these, these arrogant, condescending assumptions about the rest of society, and they water down their radical analysis in order to, they think that's a, a way to better communicate it with other people. And so what you see is, is right at the moment when there are actually greater revolutionary possibilities in society, the people who have the most experience fighting back and organizing themselves and whatnot, they actually distance themselves from revolutionary politics in favor of a sort of left-wing populism. And when that happens, you lose a lot of great opportunities for revolution because when, when you can, you know, take over the whole bakery and, and, you know, burn down all the machinery and, and, and create a communal society, you know, they're talking about reform or, you know, they're talking about going on strike. So that's, that's a big problem. Sometimes people without realizing it, make a dichotomy between direct action and mutual aid, which is of course, that's a, that's a split that should never be made because those things go well to uh, so well together. So, you know, some people focus just on the attack, just on, on, you know, direct actions that refuse mediation, that refuse representation, and other people focus more on questions of survival, on quality of life, on helping one another, on, on creating, you know, creating these, these um, uh, structures that can help people feed themselves or house themselves or whatever. Those different practices should never be split because they go together so well. That's one thing that, you know, from a distance, it seemed to me was, you know, was done really well, was happening really well in, in you know, different places in the George Floyd rebellion. Uh, like a lot of um, this continuation of the sort of pandemic mutual aid relief kind of projects, you know, in these spaces of riot and protest and all that. So that's, you know, that's, that's pretty great because that's obviously a separation that we need to avoid. So that's one way of, of missing out on these great 
great opportunities, like ones that are potentially opening up. And another one I don't have any easy answers for. It's really hard to withstand being hit simultaneously by the left and right. And that's something that that folks in the US are going to understand far better than than I can right now just because of the the intensity of of right-wing violence, all the people who have been murdered in the streets by the cops and by the fascists. And then on the other hand, like these really cynical betrayals by the left or by what passes for a left in the US. Uh, with the watering down of, of uh, the discourse of police abolition, left wingers spreading pacifism and spreading these these ridiculous idiotic conspiracy theories that it's the police who are um, you know who are responsible for the destruction and things like that. Sometimes we just don't have the strength to you know survive repression and to you know to, to um, outmaneuver these betrayals because you know with the re- the left I guess it's really a question of. Of, of trying to outmaneuver them despite them having all of these resources. The best thing that, that has occurred to me that I've been able to think of um, in, in regards to that outmaneuvering is making support for the prisoners of these rebellions central, because that's the one thing that, that the institutional leftists are never going to do. And we can apply that as much to the anti-police rebellions as to the climate movement. If we can find a way to communicate that as widely as possible, like we don't want to create more infighting, uh, you know, even as we do need to spread a critique of the institutional left, like we want to avoid infighting as much as possible. But, you know, what are the ways to, to popularize this idea to the max that if you don't support the prisoners of a rebellion, you're no better than a snitch, a cop, you're not actually a part of the rebellion. And and so that way we can, we can you know, these different organizations that are all of a sudden doing a whole hell of a lot of fundraising in, in you know the course of these rebellions, whether it's um, you know the climate movement or, or the anti-police movement, you know they're doing a lot of fundraising and they're able to to take over these movements. If it can just be made visible, well, you know, look look at these folks. They're not you know they're letting the ones who actually created the rebellion rot in prison. Uh, so clearly, they're not actually on our side. I'm hoping that that you know people can find a way to do that, both because the prisoners need that support. You know, we want to get these folks out as soon as possible. And if we can't get them out, we want, you know, we want them to know that they're not alone. We want to make sure they have money in their commissary. We want to make sure that they get letters and phone calls and all the rest. So it's, it's vital at, at, at that level. And I mean, you know, in general, it's been disproportionately anarchists who support um, prisoners after these rebellions. And we have limited capabilities, you know, it's, it's exhausting and, and, you know, we can't support thousands and thousands of prisoners. So we need to popularize this idea among all those other people who, you know, who got down with the rebellion and who were out in the streets. And also as a way of exposing that those who are trying to lead these movements and change the discourse of these movements without supporting the prisoners are nothing but opportunists. So, yeah, so I, I really hope that, that comrades there who have done just such an amazing job of staying in the streets for so long and surviving these, these huge levels of, of violence and state terrorism can also can also figure out a way to to effectively communicate the centrality of supporting the prisoners. Uh, that's you know that's that's all I got. I've been scratching my head, thinking long and hard about it, and hopefully that's a useful idea to to folks there. I personally think that's a that's a really awesome thing to point out. Like I I try to direct a lot of my work to support prisoners, and I feel like it's I don't know between the ABC chapters that we have in town and and the media project, and that seems like. In this instance, it's been. I, I fully agree with you. Like, I think that a movement, is shit if it doesn't support its its prisoners, and if it if it lets people be forgotten, it not only does a disservice to those individuals and their their family, their communities, but also to the possibility of having a future movement of any sort. Absolutely. So yeah, I totally. Yeah, if this is if we don't look at this as a struggle that has to continue going and be intergenerational then we're not taking it seriously we're not yeah it's not it's not worth engaging in in the first place so thank you very much for for saying that well you've left me in a very depressed position Uh, (laughs) sorry (laughs) (laughs) well peter peter thanks a lot for for having this chat and uh as always i know folks can find your writing they can find you on terrible terrible social media if they want to find you on twitter uh, and yeah. also find your writings up uh, that the article. What was the name of the article that you published um, on Crime Think that you referenced earlier? Diagnostic of the future. And I know you just did a an interview with Submedia in relation in part to that, but also to more recent developments since 2018. And people can find your writing up on Anarchist Library, right? Yep. Yep. 
yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time, and uh, I hope you keep safe. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, and uh, good luck to you and to everyone else out there. Uh, keep on fighting, and uh, it's yeah, we'll see what happens next. You can hear other interviews we've done with Peter by visiting our website and searching for his name. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at the Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.